afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Gives me great pleasure to moderate today's uh, important discussion at COSP 14 site title uh, entitled The Inclusive Education Initiative and the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa Program, Making Disability Inclusive Education a Priority, Sharing Experiences from the World Bank's Program on Disability Ex Inclusive Education. Um, my name is Ingo Wiedehofer, and I shall be moderating today's discussion. Uh, I'm a practice manager with the Social Sustainability and Inclusion Global Practice at the World Bank. We're the Inclusive Education Initiative and the USAID Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program currently both reside. Uh, before we start our discussions, I want to bring to your attention several accessibility features that we have available for you this, uh, today. Um, first, you should be able to see the sign language interpreter pinned to the screen with the speaker who is presenting at the time. I see it. I hope uh, you do too. Um, second, we also have captioning available in English. If you would like to access that, please go to the bottom of your screen. There's an icon uh, that has CC for closed captioning, which you can click on and select show subtitles. We are also putting a link in the chat box that takes you to the streaming captioning. Um, we also want to let you know that there are two boxes for typing into. One is the Q&A for questions you have for any of our speakers today. And the second is the chat box, which is for any technical issues you might be having in accessing any of the features. Please use them for, your designated, for their designated purposes and we will do our best to address your questions and concerns. All video and audio for participants will be turned off to ensure internet connectivity. If you have a question, please use the chat box to post that question. Um, lastly, this seminar is being recorded for those who are unable to attend and will be disseminated widely. It's great to be moderating today's discussion, not only because we have a fantastic speaker lineup, but also because we have an opportunity to learn and to reflect on the experiences from the different uh, World Bank supported activities on disability inclusive education, particularly as we are still dealing with the challenges, the many challenges that have stemmed from the COVID-19 pandemic. As the spread of COVID-19 begins to slow in many places um, that have better access to vaccines, and as people begin in those places to return to pre-pandemic or post-pandemic ways, we can't forget that the pandemic continues unabated at the same time in very many places, um, and especially many of the countries in which we work. Before we start today's discussion, I want to take a moment just to provide some context for this discussion. We know that significant gaps exist in terms of children's with children with disabilities access to school, staying enrolled in school, and opportunities to achieve quality learning outcomes that would prepare them for further growth and success. We also know that many additional supports for children with disabilities are found at school, including access to meal programs and different types of therapies. It's also critical to remember that school is not just about learning, it's also about developing relationships with peers and the social skills that will help them outside of the classroom in their future lives. Recognizing the enormous challenge in addressing the educational needs of children with disabilities at scale, the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program was launched in 2017 with funding from USAID and the Inclusive Education Initiative was launched in 2019 as the multi-donor trust fund overseen by the World Bank with support from the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD, and UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. It's been exciting to observe the work that's being accomplished to expand the educational participation of learners with disabilities under these two ventures. For me, one of the most exciting results has been to see how the grants of, of fairly modest amounts, when strategically linked with policy dialogue and large development lending programs, have been able to generate tangible, tangible products and outcomes and ripple effects with, with which suggest longer term impacts are feasible. Today's session will bring together learnings and experiences from the World Bank programs on disability inclusive educations. Stakeholders will critically discuss the purpose, process and implementation modalities of these activities and how education actors are supported to ensure that no child is left behind, especially during COVID-19. So without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Charlotte McLean-Nachlapo. 
Charlotte is the Global Disability Advisor for the World Bank Group and the manager of both trust funds uh, that I mentioned above. Her work at the World Bank, World Bank is focused on disability inclusive development and our twin goals to end poverty and boost shared prosperity. As our global disability advisor, she supports operational teams across the institution to ensure that bank policies, programs and projects are disability inclusive. So Charlotte, over to you to first introduce us to the IEI and the Inclusive Indi Education Initiative and all the many activities that have been taking place under its auspices. Thank you very much, Ingo. I'm really happy to be here today to share both the Inclusive Education Initiative, but also the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program, which focuses on operationalizing disability inclusive education in low income country contexts, including in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. I want to spend a few minutes giving an overview of the Inclusive Education Initiative, which I will now refer to as the IEI. It was launched in 2019, and we recently celebrated our second anniversary, and I'm happy to report out on the many activities that are un going under this initiative. The IEI is a multi-donor trust fund, as mentioned by Ingo. It's overseen by the World Bank and supported and support, uh, with support from NORAD and the FCDO. It invests in catalytic technical expertise and knowledge resources that support countries in making education progressively inclusive for children across the spectrum of disability. Next slide, please. So the next slide puts forward the three pillars of the IEI. The first is the in-country interventions. This includes investing in systems strengthening for inclusive education in three focus countries. The countries are Nepal, Ethiopia and Rwanda. For today's session, we shall be learning more from Nepal. My colleague Shretlana will be speaking in a moment about some of the activities that she is leading in Nepal with support from the IEI. The second pillar is the global public good pillar. And this provides support to partners to develop research, evidence and resources to operationalize disability inclusive education. The third pillar is the innovation window, which provides funding for innovation. It invests in testing and scaling innovations uh, that can address complex challenges in response to inclusive education. As I noted, I will allow Shwetlana to speak more to pillar one in, and her work in uh, Nepal. So I will focus more on pillars two and three. Next slide, please. So pillar two is the global public goods pillar that I mentioned, and it focuses on generating knowledge and research to increase information and understanding of inclusive education. The IEI has developed several global public goods and many more are underway. Last among the suite of resources is the just-in-time issues paper titled Pivoting to Inclusion, Leveraging Lessons Learned from COVID-19 Crisis for Learners with Disabilities. This paper focuses on addressing the educational and social needs for learners with disabilities at a global, regional, and country level, of course, during the COVID crisis. Next slide, please. The next slide shows the shows how we inform how the issue paper informs um, the, the 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 sorry to inform the issues paper. The IEI launched um, the Learners with Disabilities Survey. The survey was essentially a survey when we noticed that there was insufficient, or very limited evidence available on the experience of learners with disabilities during the onset of pandemics, that we thought it would be important to initiate a survey. The survey report will be available soon. Next slide. The IEI also has a community of practice. And this community of practice is a platform to exchange knowledge, 
inform and share ideas on inclusive education. Since its launch in early 2020, the IEI community of practice has grown over 1,500 members with a range of stakeholders, including ministry officials, teachers, parents of children with disabilities, technical experts, donors, and many more. In addition to the, co the community of practice, we have a monthly newsletter. And it goes, it goes out with contributions from members and presents a constant flow of information and knowledge on disability inclusive education. We also launched under the IEI our accessible website at the beginning of this year, where all the resources are housed in our knowledge repository. And we have and we host a blog platform called Words for Inclusion. Next slide. In collaboration with our colleagues in the global education practice, we have revised the World Bank's Teach tool to capture inclusive teaching practices within the primary classrooms. This work is also informing the development of Teach ECE and Teach Secondary, important tools in addressing aspects related to teaching in the classroom. Next slide. We are currently conducting a landscape review looking at how ICT can improve the learning outcomes of children with disabilities at primary school level and how this impacts or, or is impacted by the wider ed tech system. The IEI is also keen to learn about experiences in using ICT to support learning during COVID-19 school closures. Findings will be based on a global survey, multiple expert roundtables, and an in-depth case studies from Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nepal, and Rwanda. Next slide. Finally, we will be launching our research exchange workshop series next week, a project that I am particularly excited about. This project or this part of the IEI will bring together researchers from Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia to identify research priorities in the field of disability inclusive education and provide a space where we can begin to unpack and better understand the challenges that Southern scholars face as they, con as they conduct research and publish their work on disability inclusive education. Our ultimate goal from this is to increase the visibility and collaboration of Southern researchers in the field of disability inclusive education. Next slide, please. The next slide speaks to our third pillar. And this pillar is the IEI's innovation window, which has generated a lot of interest. We've recently cl closed a call for proposals from external civil society organizations and internal World Bank teams and received a total of 102 proposals. We are finalizing interesting innovations related to child empowerment, disability data, school mobility, accessible digital books, and so forth. These proposals come from across regions and we expect to make an announcement of eight awards shortly. And now to my last slide. As you can tell, there is a lot happening under the IEI. And we welcome everyone to join our community of practice on LinkedIn or visit our accessible website, which is updated on an almost daily basis with new resources and information on disability inclusive education. And I'll hand back over to you, Ingo. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I believe we're, for that, that great overview, I think we're moving on to Shvetlana uh, to give us an overview of the IEI's work uh, in Nepal. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Shvetlana. I see you on screen. I hope you, you can see and hear us. Thanks so much, uh, Ingo, and thanks, Charlotte. Uh, I have eight minutes and I'm determined to be on time. So let me dive right in. My name is Svetlana. I'm leading the Inclusive Education Initiative 
uh, on behalf of World Bank in Nepal, alongside a great team that's based in Kathmandu. So when we designed the program, we deliberately designed it around three pillars, diagnostics to really understand and quantify the scale of the problem, the nature of the problem, solutions to help surface, you know, what is it that the government needs to do? What is it that's promising? What is it that can be scaled today, tomorrow, in the near future? And then to feed these diagnostics and solution ideas into the system conversation for sustained change, right? And we were very excited about it and everything was launched. Uh, the Nepal program was launched in February, 2020. And I don't think I need to tell you what happened after that, right? So uh, just as we were getting going, everything got derailed completely. But I'm glad to report that despite all of this, I think we were able to make significant progress. And I think now we are sort of more adept at working in this new reality. So I'm hoping for more accelerated results in the near future. So what we've been able to achieve so far under each of the pillar is that for diagnostics, we've been able to map what are the resources currently available to children with disabilities from the system, right? Uh, we've also done uh, a little bit of an investigation on how teachers are viewing children with disabilities in their classroom. Uh, we wanted to do this for all the subsectors of education, but we've only been able to do it for early childhood education so far and plan to do it also for primary and secondary. And then responding to the COVID-19 crisis, we pivoted to looking at mental health because we were hearing anecdotal evidence of the big, big impact, negative impact on student mental health. And we have more forthcoming work on learning needs, mindset, stigma. Now on system strengthening, we are extremely fortunate in Nepal to have a really active and engaged and just wonderful community of practice around uh, inclusive education, which comprises of the government and all the other donors and to a more limited extent, uh, civil society and um, NGOs. And I know Ian Atfield is here. I, I hope some others from this community of practice are here too. It's a really great working group that comes together. And together, I think we've really pooled our efforts and we've made, I would say, tangible difference. So one big difference is that inclusive education is now featured prominently, and especially children, for disability, children with disability uh, concerns and constraints and education are featured in the new education sector plan. And I don't need to tell this audience, I mean, this is a huge thing because it will then impact the design of the government's next flagship education program in Nepal and the lending by different donors. Now, the donors together are also working on different levers within the system. And we try to sort of uh, coordinate and not step on each other's toes, but rather complement each other. So within this group, I would say the World Bank has a slight comparative advantage on the assessment side. So we're really working on measuring learning, tracking learning uh, for children with disability. And finally, on the solution side, we have launched rigorous impact evaluations of some of the most promising local ideas, locally grown ideas. And we should see uh, the results come out in the next eight to 10 months on improving quality of education for children with disabilities in early childhood, tech-enabled solutions. So these are mobile apps for foundational math, uh, sign language, and there's also a new app on uh, promoting stigma reduction. And then we have some new work on mental health, promoting mental health among adolescents. So quickly on the barriers, because I wanna keep some time for lessons learned. So again, I think this audience knows more than I do probably, uh, but you know, the one topic that gets talked about very often is this lack of appreciation, right? For the scale of the problem, the specific uh, issues that children with disabilities face, um, the, the nature of the constraints are so specific, sometimes people don't realize it. 
so I think bringing light to these issues is really important. And I think IEI is doing a great job at moving the need needle on that front. Now, there are two other things that I don't see discussed enough, right? So one is the problem of prioritization. Now, I think we all know this, we all understand it. It's just a very, very binding constraint at the country level, right? So fiscal space is extremely limited. The demands are vast and overwhelming, and they have become even more pressing with COVID-19, right? So how do you get this agenda on the table? And then, you know, related to this is this point about solutions. So, you know, there is a perception sometimes from the outside that when you make it clear to the government and to stakeholders that a problem is dire, that it's urgent, that will prompt action, right? And that's a very understandable view to have. But in my lived experience, it's sometimes the opposite, right? It's only when you come to the table with solutions, with, you know, with hope, with some optimism that things can be changed, that things can work, that you see the government really respond, that you see the government really willing to take action. So I think the agenda that IEI has of not just bringing data and information, but also uh, innovations and solutions, and also to align all the donors together, uh, to speak in the same language, to push the same things. I think all of these are going to make a huge difference in this really difficult uh, discussion you know, with the government. Okay. So the lessons learned, I'll try to be quick, but this is where I've put like my most interesting bits. Uh, so as I've already mentioned, information is just the starting point. Um, so I won't go into that again. So there are, the second point is something that you see discussed a lot in general education. I haven't seen it discussed enough in the question of inclusive education, which is that, you know, we have, some services available to children with disabilities, even in developing countries. But there are two problems. One, the services are not available to enough people, right? And second, the services that are available fall short of being meaningful in terms of quality, right? So I do think that stakeholders in this space have to have a real conversation about the trade-off, right? Where are we spending the marginal dollar? Are we spending it on expanding services or are we spending it to make existing services more meaningful? And that is a real tension at the country level given the limited fiscal space. And then the last two points I think are interrelated that what was really shocking to me with the data work that we've done and the impact evaluations we're doing is just how crucial mindsets are right, that so many people in the space, you know, even, uh, you know, forget policymakers, right, even principals, even teachers, even parents themselves, right, often have very negative and fixed mindsets about education for children with disabilities, right? Do they, is this really a disability? That's number one. Can something be done about it? Should these children be accommodated? Is this a priority? Where should we really be, where should the parent be spending their attention on the child without disabilities or the child with disabilities, right? So all of this is really coming down to very fixed mindsets about what these children can do, can achieve and how they can live. So I think that needle has to be moved. And related to that is the problem of stigma, which is really, really high in disabilities related to mental health, right? It's just shocking to me, just the degree of toxic masculinity, for instance, as an example that we see in some of these places. So I want to leave you with this one, again, sort of trade-off, right? That there is a lot of conversation when you go talk to the government, when you go talk to the non-technical crowd, there's a lot of conversation about hard investments, right? About the RAMs, about the Braille textbooks and all of that. And that's great, that's extremely important. But there is an other piece of the puzzle, right? Which is the glacier beneath the ocean, which is this problem of mindset and stigma. And these have to be tackled with the more, uh, pe what people call soft investments, right? Um, and those tend to get deprioritized, but they are absolutely essential for long-term change, for sustained change, for transformational change. 
And I think we so also, uh, as TTLs, have to do a better job with getting this work more rigorous. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Svetlana, for those, those thoughts and insights. And I think in particular, those last two um, really important to keep in mind. With that, let me turn it back over to Charlotte, um, who will give us an overview of the USAID Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program before we move into Thanks. some examples. Thanks, Ingo. And, and thank you very much to Svetlana. I'm happy now to uh, provide a bit of background on the USAID Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program that I mentioned. So in 2017, the World Bank and the USAID established this program. The program is a $3 million trust fund to increase access and enrollment for children with disabilities to primary school and to design and implement inclusive education programs across Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide, please. The trust fund aims to benefit students with disabilities by financing World Bank executed activities that leverage USAID programs, World Bank projects, and very importantly, analytical work. Through these activities, we hope to increase the stakeholder knowledge and capacity towards inclusive education for primary learners with disabilities in Sub-Saharan Africa. We seek to increase the use of evidence-based programmatic and policy recommendations, as well as tools to design and implement inclusive education interventions by African governments and de development practitioners. Next slide. This trust fund also includes three pillars, which I'd like to review with you quickly. And each pillar is We've got three Ds for these three pillars. The first pillar is around diagnostics, diagnostics and analytics. And the objective of this pillar is to strengthen the evidence base on the status of the inclusion of children with disabilities and the return on investments on different types of policy and programmatic interventions to support inclusive education in Africa. So very much along the lines of what Shretlana was talking about. The second pillar, is uh, the pillar that looks at demonstrative pilot activities. The objective of this pillar is to build capacity and promote the design and implementation of better policies and improved strategies and operations by governments in targeted countries to work towards the educational participation of children with disabilities. And then the third D and third pillar is the objective has the objective to disseminate curated knowledge from the funded from the funded analytical work. So this is uh, the pillar on dissemination. This is done through policy and knowledge briefs, recommendations for programmatic and policy change, through blogs, through webinars, and through social media channels. Next slide, please. Under pillar one. We are investing in analytical reports on key economic, social, and sector-specific issues on disability inclusion, and within that, specific challenges to educational participation and achievement. Reports that have resulted from this USAID trust fund include the challenge of inclusive education in Sub-Saharan Africa, which analyzes gaps in education opportunities for children with disabilities, in the region and looking ahead visual impairment and school eye health programs which analyzes the gaps in educational outcomes for children who are blind or who have low vision in comparison to those children that don't both reports look at enrollment literacy primary school completion and perform and the performance of children with disabilities and a very exciting piece of work is a multi-country diagnostic study that we're conducting. And this will have two sub-studies, one on the social determinants of disability inclusive education, and one on the school and teacher preparedness for learners with disabilities. It uses a mixed method, method study, and it includes reviews of the policy environment, budget allocations towards inclusive education, as well as 
um, interviews with key informants. We use surveys and focus group discussions with a range of stakeholders, including but not limited to government officials, school administrators, teachers, and very importantly, organizations of persons with disabilities. Next slide, please. Under pillar two, we have the country level activities. So quite similar to the IEI. And currently we have um, activities taking place in Ethiopia, Ghana, Lesotho, Liberia, Senegal, the Gambia and Zambia. And as we heard from Shretlana, under the IEI, we have a similar project um, taking place in Nepal. We will soon hear from my colleague Mupu from Zambia, who is uh, leading work in Zambia using support from this particular trust fund. This chart shows the various thematic areas that program activities fall under, including the transition to inclusive education resource centers, creation and promotion of teacher training modules, development of screening and identification tools, a very important piece of this work, and bringing awareness to the community on the importance of disability inclusive education. Next slide. And so finally, pillar three includes dissemination of the many materials and the learning and learnings that have come out from under this trust fund. We have presented these findings at UCFET, and today we're happy to share them with you and, and have you use them and use them to influence policy dialogue and programmatic work that you are engaged in. We're also conducting learning sessions between USAID and the World Bank to share the kind of progress that is possible with targeted funds like this and to ensure that knowledge is going both ways. And this is very much part of our dissemination strategy. And so with that, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for the description of this second program supporting disability inclusive education. It's great to see that. Um, let me pivot and zoom in to, for another country perspective here by inviting uh, my colleague, Mupi Waliwa, um, an economist with the World Bank to share his reflections from an implementation lens in Zambia, which is one of the USAID Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program grantees. Over to you, Upo. Uh, thanks, Ingo, and uh, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I think uh, from Zambia, I would say uh, we're very excited actually to share uh, our experience having implemented uh, this grant in Zambia. And I think uh, Shotlana has already done a lot of uh, talking and uh, highlighting some of the issues I think that are coming out, especially when you want to speak, uh, when you start to speak about disabilities. I think uh, it's maybe just something to stress again that I think for us in Zambia, one of the things that really uh, tries to influence our work is the kind of everyday experiences that we get, the conversations that uh, we have with different people. So if you speak to a planner, for instance, in the Ministry of Finance and talk to them about disability, again, the issue of mindset or perspectives, they'll tell you oh, that's kind of a very expensive you know, area to actually even invest in as education. If you speak to villagers in the villages, especially when we go um, in the field, for instance, um, you actually also hear that people in the communities, as uh, Swetlana say, really do not appreciate very much in terms of uh, what kind of uh, support or how they can actually contribute to really push the agenda on uh, inclusive education. And with that, I think our main drive uh, when we're doing this work was really to try and create what we would call a school for everyone. And what we mean by that is that, can we bring on board uh, people that actually are key to making sure that 
the school for everyone uh, is realized. And uh, these are the teachers, these are the you know, school managers themselves, and these are planners you know, at, who are planning for the whole uh, system and the community because these kids indeed uh, come uh, from the community. And so with that, when we got the funding, the government was actually very excited because inclusive education has been one of the things that they have been trying to push forward since 1977, when the first guidelines uh, in the education system were done. But there hasn't been a significant progress made. Uh, of course, there are donors uh, doing, you know, small scale kind of interventions here and there, but I think it is important as well, and the government realizes that it is important that for them to be able to build a system that actually is ready to support inclusive learning for all the learners. Um, there's need to do, uh, you know, certain things. And through the, uh, the management of the Ministry of General Education, a working group, or a task force was formed. And that's the task force actually that has been working um, with us from the start. And we went through the process to try and understand what was already available and where the gaps were for us to really come up with something that would fill in the gaps and try to make a real difference. And based on that, we decided to embark on three uh, major activities. And the first one we had to do was to develop a teacher training manual. But then we realized that actually the government has uh, colleges of education, they have universities, but the educators actually at those institutions do not have uh, sufficient knowledge to prepare the teachers that will be able to also support children when they come to school. And so we went through the process of actually consultation with various stakeholders who are involved in teacher training and also to understand uh, from the practice, from the teachers themselves in terms of what is available and that which they do not have. And based on that, we actually came up uh, with a teacher manual. And that teacher manual is a guide both for trainers or teacher educators in the colleges of education. And also it is a resource for the teachers in the classroom to be able to help them actually handle or support the children with disabilities effectively because we realize that although the system has over 100 teachers in the system, most of them do not have the basic skills and knowledge on how actually to deal or support uh, children uh, with disabilities. So that manual is ready and the government already, because it is an ownership, uh, I think which was also very much emphasized the government has taken it up and this is the manual that has been verified by their own authorities that verify material that can be used in schools as well as colleges of education and it's gone through that process already and the colleges of education have been identified and now the teacher educators will be oriented but at the same time that is expected to go down to the teachers in the schools so that was the first product uh, that we developed using uh, the grant money. Next slide. The next slide, please. So, um, and Mupo, I would just ask you to be conscious of time. Sorry to, to jump in, yeah. but please be mindful yeah. of the time. Thanks. Thank you. I have very few slides. <laughs> So I should be able to go through the slides uh, very quickly. Uh, so the next uh, activity, we developed uh, materials 
for the three different uh, stakeholders that were key. The first one is the community, and then the school managers, including head teachers. And I think the issue there was if it is a community, how can the community actually be there to support families as well as children with disabilities so that they are able to feel very supported and be included within the education system. And for the teachers or for the head teachers and the managers, I, the issue is really to allow them to go through self-reflection on what actually matters to be able to promote inclusive education within their school and how they can work with the community to effectively provide an environment that is friendly to all kids and uh, that is uh, inclusive. So we have these materials and the trainings also have already begun. Uh, we have trained already at the provincial level, at the district, and it will be rolled out uh, to school in a phased manner. And next slide, please. And the, the, the last activity, uh, the last activity, I think I've, I've already talked at uh, the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the last activity that we embarked on uh, was an audit. So within the education system, uh, the ministry accounts for the teaching and learning material that is there, but very little is actually known on uh, inclusive education material. And we use part of this money to actually undertake an audit so that we are informed in terms of what is available in school. And as an extension to that, we also tried to understand what teachers know, if at all they do, on how to use these materials effectively in the classrooms. And we have very interesting results actually coming out from this audit, which should be able to help the ministry in designing uh, material for learners with disabilities, but at the same time help them to plan on how to provide materials uh, for the disabled. And at the next slide. So in terms, in terms of uh, barriers, uh, enablers, lessons, I think uh, Sotlana has done a very, uh, very, very uh, good job. But I just want to say that I think what we have uh, length from uh, doing uh, these activities is that if there is a policy framework and there is a legal, there's a legal framework and the policy environment is there and the government is actually willing and able to commit to doing something, I think it can be done. And we have seen it like from the start, the government team was fully involved and they have actually even guided on where and how some of the things could be done easily, even with little resources that we have, for instance, uh, as a country, there is really shortage in terms of uh, resources to do some of these things. But uh, the first, and I think the most important thing also, as Shotlana has mentioned, is the mindset. And we know, I think that for us, it's the issue of behavioral change. There's no way we are going to actually talk about uh, inclusive education until people come to understand that actually it is an important thing that we need to talk about. And every child or every person, regardless of disabilities, they should be given an opportunity to actively participate. But behavioral change is a process and I think we can see that even as we were working through with the government that some people were not willing actually in the first place to support, but with time they have come on board. Resources also are important financial resources to be able to support this work. From 1977 up to now, not much actually has moved on this issue because there has not been a consistent pattern in actually supporting this activity. And I think if we need to make a real difference, we need to continue working on this issue. We need to continue talking about it. And I think lastly, to say that 
this is not a, a topic or an issue that is about them or not us. I think what it is for us to be able to achieve and have an inclusive world where everyone actually is valued and can participate is that we need to work as a team. So we need us and not them, and we need to we need each other in order to make uh, the difference. Ingo, I hope I've managed within my time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mupu. Almost, I would say. <laughs> I think let's we'll have to. I think uh, move forward fairly quickly with the rest of the agenda. But um, you know, at this stage, what I would like to do is to um, ask a couple of the discussants that we have. Uh, this morning with us to provide some reflections on the presentations of the work under these trust funds. Um, Nancy Mendy is the Principal Education Officer in the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia. Um, Nancy, we're really pleased to have you here today. The Gambia is another country that has benefited from the USA Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program. What are some of your reflections on the impacts of these trust funds on disability inclusive education? from your perspective. I believe you're on mute, uh, Anna. Oh, Nancy, sorry. I think I'm on mute now. Hello, yes. can you all hear me? Yes, we can um, hear you. My name is Nancy Mendy. I work with the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, and I'm a director of early childhood and inclusive education. My presentation, because it's three minutes, I'm just going to mm, Nancy, looks like you're frozen. Can anybody else see over here, Nancy? I believe we have Nancy frozen. Let's give this a few seconds and otherwise we'll perhaps ask her to come back at a later stage and move on to another discussant. Okay. I think we've lost her. She may be reconnecting. Um, what I would suggest that we do is at this point, I would then turn to um, Koli Banik um, to um, give us some um, uh, remarks. Um, so Koli Banik is a senior education advisor at USAID and a real champion behind the Disability Inclusive Education in Africa program. So welcome the, today uh, to joining us this today, colleague, uh, Koli. Can you perhaps from your perspectives share with us some remarks on your own impressions of the results so far from the funds that USAID has provided towards the program, this program focused on disability inclusive education. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I'm actually in um, Zambia right now. So I was say hello to my colleague uh, from the World Bank. Um, I'm in Lusaka right now in our USAID office, uh, helping some colleagues um, out. Um, but we've been really happy with what we've been able to do with the World Bank, uh, with this Disability Inclusive Education um, in Africa program. You know, it just was in 2017, and uh, for $3 million is a small amount of funds, but we were able to do so much. It's been so catalytic, I think, um, that and it, it got some response from, our, uh, from the World Bank's TTLs, to task team leaders, and we got so many proposals for uh, activities that you know, for small funds, but I, they were doing such innovative research that's so important for this area. Um, and as Charlotte had mentioned, you know, we've done so many different interesting things. Um, and I think some of the highlights. Sorry, is there an echo? Can you hear me? No, can you keep going. Um, Nancy, I'll come back to you after Colleen's spoken. Okay. Thanks. Um, some of the things that we did were this in-country intervention. So we provided almost $1.5 million in grants um, in seven countries across Africa. And we've heard from those program, for example, in Zambia and also in the Gambia. Um, we also support these events for cost. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do anything in person over the last two years. But previously, we did in 2017 and 18. Um, we had in-person meetings, which were really important to have. 
Um, we've also did something in 2018 in, in Nairobi in Kenya, we had the first ever um, disability inclusive education um, meeting between Ministry of uh, Education officials in, in 11 different countries in the Africa region, with, as, well, as well as with UNICEF, um, the World Bank and USAID colleagues. And it, it was like a really a, a fantastic event, but I think we're hoping to have like some follow on to that. But unfortunately, because of COVID, I think things have just been um, put on hold. Um, but we're hoping to continue the program um, and see what happens in the next two years um, with, with our partnership with the World Bank. And also, um, you know, with the impacts of COVID on children with disabilities, I think there's lots of work that needs to be done um, looking at the long-term impacts. So I think um, outside of the, this work that we've supported, I think there's definitely opportunities for other areas where we can invest um, and do research and um, design programs to, to help children with disabilities. Um, so I'll end there and pass it back to a colleague from, back to Ingo, thanks. Thank you, Koli. Um, let me turn back to Nancy to see if we can, if her connection has improved at this point from the Gambia. Thank you very much. I think um, I'll be able to do it within this before the internet goes off. Um, as I said, the situation we had really challenges in terms of identification, assessment, and training of teachers to be, really be able to help them to support children with special needs. So with the TF, um, USAID TF grant, we hired a consultant and one of the things that he had to do or some of the things is to strengthen the capacity to adequately identify children with disabilities, to use the data and to equip classroom teachers with skills that would focus on inclusive teaching. Um, with that, we developed um, an assessment tool which later was used to train teachers and also an, an inclusion training module was also developed to support children and um, teachers supporting. Um, so the training of teachers was held for um, the cluster monitors, the IT and teachers and other people. So our step, step down training was also held to help these teachers. So we trained about 1,460 teachers from 730 schools. Um, to, they benefited from the training. So with the training, um, this year, year which is information that is collected on data on children with special needs. If you look at the trend from 2019 to date, for, 20, for 2019, um, we look at the percentage because we have seen an increase in the number of clean tool has, has helped identify the children with special needs. So the next step would be um, to sort of um, assess the children that are identified, provision of customized ad adaptive teaching and learning materials, and training for in-service teachers on the inclusive model. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I think we got most of that. Um, so thank you for sharing those, those reflections. Um, let me now turn to Ian Atfield, who's a senior education advisor at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the Government of the UK to provide some remarks on the impact of the IEI activities so far and the importance for donors to invest in disability inclusive education. Ian, over to you with the red background there. See you well. Yeah, thanks, Ingo, and uh, apologies. I, I'm not in a karaoke bar, but I had to leave Nepal given the um, really threat, you know, with the real risks of the pandemic and the second wave that have been absolutely enormous in, in, in South Asia. Um, I was involved in setting up the Inclusive Education Initiative back in 2018 in the Global Dis Disability Summit. And so I'm really proud and, you know, amazed to see it here and listen to some of the progress that has been made. I, I've been focusing on, a, on other priorities around girls' education that have been actively involved as part of that uh, donor group in Nepal uh, on the work. So it was really heartening to hear the um, summary of work by Shwet Lena, which I'll, I'll comment on. Um, you know, ambitious commitments made at the 2018 summit. We hope to see more in the 22 summit coming up. Uh, next, it will be import really important more than ever given the impact that, that COVID has on the um, on people with disabilities, you know, just to sort of pluck a statistic, 59% of early 
COVID deaths in the UK were of people living with disabilities. In Nepal, as in many countries, uh, children with disabilities are not at school, they're stuck at home, they're feeling more anxious, isolated and depressed. All of those issues around uh, mental health are really important right now. Um, I think that I've been really, really impressed to hear about the work to mainstream some of the World Bank's um, global public goods, such as the teach classroom observations, um, refining and revising these to make them to incorporate aspects of disability inclusive teaching, I think is a, is a really useful, important way, together with the other methods that Charlotte outlined around the community of practice, some of these calls for proposals, the evidence review, the, you know, the uh, uh, as in the three stage theory of change that um, Charlotte laid out, uh, uh, laid out, you do need the evidence around what can be scaled, because I think where inclusive education has struggled over the years is to really come up with strong scalable solutions and, and to be able to demonstrate that with demonstrated scalable solutions that's when you can expect both donor and government resources to start flowing um the stock take the diagnostic survey of resource centers resource classes and assessment centers done in nepal through the ai i thought was really useful it was more difficult to do given the um COVID closures and the use of remote phone surveys. But it made clear the challenges to go in that progressive realization towards inclusive education. You know, the reality in Nepal and in many countries is that segregated education provision is still the norm. And I think we've seen that in the chat bar today from various uh, audience members, hence the importance of the actionable solutions. Um, Already, I would say that the work from AI in Nepal is, is already informing the new 10-year education sector plan under, under development. There's a strong disability approach paper being led by the Under Secretary Divya Diwali, uh, with very strong government donor backing, which I think is great. And we've already seen uh, aspects of disability inclusive education embedded into the GPE accelerated COVID-19 response with resources to help children with disabilities catch up on their learning and raise awareness of teachers, leaders and communities. So overall, I think, you know, that's a real practical advantage I've seen in the Nepal structures. Um, I'd like to see actionable solutions in other areas, for example, integrating the Nepal disability ID card system, which is under reform due to the change to the federal government structures, provides real opportunities to link data and government resources towards inclusive education in a more joined up way. To close, I'd like to say that I'm really impressed by the great work of both the trust funds being discussed today. And we really must think about how we can scale from these pathfinder countries more broadly. Um, my plea would be to obviously speed up the acceleration. Uh, we all recognize these difficult times that we live in of both uh, trust funds, including the IAI and to mainstream disability inclusive education programming right across the World Bank global practice, help lever the really large resources that do exist within, within government. Just under half of World Bank education projects, uh, a small ad hoc survey was done earlier this year, and only just under half of World Bank global education practice programs currently have a partial or significant level of disability inclusive education um, built into their design. The target is to try to get that to 100% by 2025. So we'd really love to see progress on that. And I think this is really a strong way that we can build the case for inclusive education investments. This is a difficult and challenging time to convince ministers of finance uh, to invest in this area when we know the, the economic destructive impact COVID has had and obviously the competing priorities that exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just uh, so Ramon will take a, a short break um, from the uh, the our IS interpreter. I hope Monica, how are you doing? You need a break also. Yes, we both need a break. Okay, so um, I hope it's okay if we can continue while Ramon and, and Monica take a short break. And um, do you know what time it will be over? Just so that we know. Um, I think we're scheduled to go until, I, I mean, uh, around 11.20. Okay. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, you mean the break or, or the whole No, no, session? no. What, 
What time is the session scheduled to be finished? Okay, around 11.20. Okay. Okay, thank you thank so you much. Thank you both. So let me turn now to, um, uh, to get a perspective from an organization of persons with disabilities from Nepal. Uh, so Mrs. Patima, uh, Pratima, sorry, Gurung is from the Nepal Indigenous Disabled Women Association. Um, Pratima, if you could provide us with some short remarks on the impact of the IEI that in Nepal so far and the importance of engagement with OPDs throughout the process. I see you, Pratima. Can you? Yeah, thank okay. you. You're with us. Good. Excellent. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you for organizing this important event, uh, making disability inclusive education a priority. So I'm Pratima Gurung and I represent uh, Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network and National Indigenous Disabled Women Association of Nepal. And it is an honor for me to speak in this event to highlight uh, the OPDS perspectives. So we work on the intersections of gender, disability, ethnicity in the context of Nepal, working on the most marginalized groups like young indigenous women with disabilities and inclusive education is one of the area that we have been working at the grassroots level since 2016. I agree with all my earlier speakers who have said light on the impact and importance of inclusive education initiatives in different countries. And I also ensure my commitments from an organization label. We welcome the Global Partnership for Education and also the COVID-19 Accelerated Funding and Inclusive Education Initiatives targeting for children with disabilities in Nepal. From an OPDS perspective, uh, I would like to say and highlight that the attempt which has started is a very good initiative. We have also gone through the report published by the World Bank, which is good and rich. But still, we see that we still hope to have the edu execution of, the, of those documents and evidences at the grassroots level, which is very much crucial at all levels. We also appreciate the efforts which has been highlighted by the IEE, IEI projects during the first wave of the COVID. However, when it comes to the second wave of COVID, all the efforts have to reach to all children with disabilities and their families, which is our priority from the OPDS perspective. We would also like to highlight that uh, children with disabilities are not a homogeneous group. And the broader uh, framework of inclusion has to be framed not only in terms of impairment related with children with disabilities, but also the different social categories like gender, ethnicity, geography, class, regions, and it intersections. And it is very much relevant in the context of Nepal, where Nepal is a very diverse country in many aspects. In addition, the word inclusive, uh, the word inclusive education has to be framed in a very broader and comprehensive framework. The government of Nepal has the vulnerability development, uh, community development framework in the context of Nepal, and it is very much crucial for the inclusive education initiatives that has to be framed in a very comprehensive and holistic manner by engaging and consulting with the consultations of the organization of people with disabilities, including the civil society organizations. And in this regard, I would also like to highlight about the participation and engagement of organizations of people with disabilities at the grassroots level from the diverse group, which is very much crucial to maintain and to understand the demand and supply side and to invest and analyze the gaps of the school sector reform plan and contribute on the ongoing form of the school sector development plan. Because we realize and we notice that we still have challenges in the teaching learning process and the engagement of children with disabilities. Engaging in the learning process with the learning outcomes is still a question. And the importance of education with a practical part, with the skills and behavioral part is very much important and crucial at the grassroots level when it comes to children with disabilities. In this regard, the COVID-19 pandemic reality has brought both challenges and opportunities for us to use the teaching learning process equipped with technology. We know there are different challenges related with children with disabilities and their family members for accessing 
using and familiar being familiar with all this technology. But at the same time, I would also like to highlight that we see those opportunities if the demand and supply side are balanced and, and, and are being consulted with the organization of people with disabilities. And I see the hope that in the context like Nepal, where we have different geographical conditions and, and, and the ruler of urban setting, I see the, the, the avenues are opened and, and the role of OPDs are very much crucial because the meaningful engagement and consultations at all levels, including their family members, teachers, schools, government and development partners are crucial. It is very important for including right holders and relevant stakeholders to build an ena enabling inclusive environment in a very in intersectional approach to discuss about the need and priorities with the open mindset to the problems that we have. We also know that we have challenges and with these challenges, we also know that we, there are solutions. And for this, I would like to invite all these kind of initiatives that is happening at the global level and to reflect those global level initiatives at the grassroots level so that we could ensure that no children will be left behind and the inclusive education initiatives will be transformed into reality. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Pratima. Uh, let's check, let me check with our translators whether they're able to come back on for the last 10 minutes or so. Monica, we have you back. We have Ramon back. I know that was a short break, sorry. And I just wanted to say, I really missed seeing the findings or the key findings of the... Okay, I would um, then, uh, I, I would suggest that we proceed. We have approximately another um, uh, 10 minutes or so to, to conclude. So there's been a rich discussion here in the sidebar in the chat. Um, with a lot of both, you know, sharing of information, sharing of, of insights and additional uh, links and, and knowledge sharing, and also a couple of, I, I think, questions. I've tried to, we've tried to sort of pull, uh, just pull a few of these out, um, uh, given the, the time limitations that we have. Um, I recognize we've gone a bit over in the discussion. So, um, I've taken a, a, a couple of the questions up and, and would ask the panelists um, for some insight. So first one, a question for you, Mupu. I saw a question about um, the engagement of communities. You talked a lot about developing materials for community members. What measures have been put in place in your case to ensure that community members can access under, and understand and put to use those materials, considering that literacy levels are usually really low in rural African communities. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ingo and uh, Jennifer for that question. So the material now, uh, the next stage, and I think this is the issue of trying also to find budget is to translate these materials into local languages. Because in Zambia, we have seven main languages and we are talking about communities that are actually everywhere in the country. So we need to translate those materials that we have developed into the seven uh, languages so that even as we engage these community members, they are actually reading uh, something that uh, they understand. But uh, of course, we know not everyone is able to, to read. And so this is why when we have these uh, community sensitization uh, activities, there will be people uh, that actually are leading this uh, conversation and just generally talking through the material uh, with the community. And I have also to mention that actually besides uh, these materials that we have done uh, for the community, they are very simple. Uh, leaflet, just kind of leaflet material. We have also uh, developed posters and these posters actually will be distributed alongside the material to be, you know, put around the communities as well as the schools, so that uh, people at least can be able to see this and remind, be reminded uh, every time on how important it is that we continue uh, talking about this issue. Uh, thanks, Ingo. Thanks, Mopo. Um, let me now take a, a question that was for Svetlana. Um, 
Svetlana, you spoke about the study the team did on early childhood education. Um, the question here is, is, have you identified and or supported early childhood intervention services for families and children from birth to, to the ages of three to five to help children develop well before school and to ensure a good transition from home or from inclusive pre-primary uh, schooling to disability inclusive primary schoolings? If not, is that something that might be considered for the future? Svetlana, do we have you still? Yes, Hello? sorry, sorry, Ingo, could you repeat? I'm so sorry. Sure. Um, so the question was really around um, preschool and, and the transition to school. So um, in, in, in the work that you did, you talked about early childhood education. Um, have you in any of these sites that you worked in identified and or supported early childhood intervention services for families and children from birth to the ages of three to five to help them uh, develop well before they enter formal school and or to ensure a good transition from home or inclusive pre-primary uh, schooling to disability inclusive primary schooling? If not, yes. is that something you might consider in yes, the future? Yes. So in, yes, in fact, that's something that we are doing. This is our this is where our impact evaluation is focused. So in Eastern Nepal, we are working with early childhood education centers. So this is pr predominantly ages three to five. And our original plan was to really work on parental outreach and teacher training on how to do this better disability inclusive education. We found that around 33% of these schools have some children with disabilities in them. However, because of COVID, we've had to scale back on the teacher training arm, but we have accelerated the parental outreach arm. So we are gonna do a lot with parents uh, of children with disabilities to kind of reach out to them and give them support and tips on how to manage this difficult time. Okay, thank you, That's Svetlana. Let me ask, uh, then pick up a third and final question. I think it, it's, it's to any of the panelists. Um, and so the question here is, is and it comes from, from Haiti, is whether we have an example of successful experience on inclusive education that is, uh, that is mind, it says mindfully diversity in low income countries, but effectively it's most of inclusive education programs refer or focus on children with physical disabilities and do not take into account or take into account enough children with learning or psychosocial um, dis disabilities. Um, so any views on, the, on that question from any of the panelists? So this is Svetlana again. So I'll just say that, you know, I think the, the question is completely on point. I think there is a tendency to not consider psychosocial disabilities uh, as being important or actually as even being real at all in some of these places. So I think in Nepal, we are working to sort of uh, provide uh, more information. Um, so we are doing the stigma reduction app, as I just mentioned, and then we'll also be doing direct work with promoting mental health among adolescents. So those topics, I think, will touch on this uh, very sort of much needed area. Ingo, can I come in here? This is Charlotte. Um, just to oh, add sorry. to that, um, I think in the in the study that we did that looked at COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 on children with disabilities, we definitely addressed the issue of children with intellectual and social psycho disabilities. Um, I would definitely, you know, refer um, the the person who asked the question to the work that's been done by Inclusion International, um, and it's you know it's an area of work where we definitely need to do more. I also want to take the opportunity now that I have the mic to speak to the, the question on, on the teach manual um, and just say that, you know, I'm actually one of the peer reviewers for that product. It's been financed or funded under the IEI. Um, and so it's in addition to the existing uh, teach manuals. So there will be one that is specific to, to disability inclusion and, and that should be coming out in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, Ingo. Yes, Moko, please. 
Um, yes, so I actually also just wanted to, uh, to add to that. Uh, I think just to say that uh, even in our case, I think the materials that we have, uh, we came across, which actually are already uh, in use uh, by, you know, teachers, for instance, I talk mostly about the, you know, physical impairment, visual and hearing impairment. And these are more like the common uh, impairments that actually are dealt with. And so we tried to go beyond that to try and bring in the issues of cognitive and learning impairment, issues of supporting children who have difficulties with speech and communication difficulties, uh, issues on behavioral, emotional and social difficulties. So if you have these kind of learners within your school or within your uh, you know, your community, how do you actually uh, support them? And I think these are sort of areas that are not really talked about much. And I think there is a lot of work also that needs to be done. And even from our own uh, audit that we did, it's very, it came out very clear that teachers actually are not even aware that there are some kids that actually just have, you know, cognitive or learning impairments or could have difficulties and emotional issues that they need to deal with as they come to, to school. Thank you. Okay, super. Thank you um, very much uh, on that for, for that additional thought as well, Mopo. Um, with that, I'm afraid that we are beginning to, or we are running out of time, and I will uh, try to, to wrap up very briefly. First, um, let me thank everybody for making the time um and 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 contributing so actively as well in, in the chats uh on the side um i think really a rich discussion and great and great to see um second you know a, a couple of key takeaways at least from me and in terms of uh, areas that require further thought and it obviously will take a lot more work first this getting to scale question how to come up with solutions that can really work for across countries and that governments can support. Um, second, related a little bit to that is the question of, is, is, is the fact that that really will take multiple stakeholders to make things work. It will take governments, it will take families, it will take communities, and it will take CSO partners and accountability partners and advocacy groups. And uh, in addition to that, I would say academic groups to make sure that there is learning um, and that then that that and 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 then processes to bring all of those together to make sure that there really is shared learning and the progress is made uh, jointly. So that's one uh, on scale. Second is a lot of work to be done really around norms and, and looking at norms, cultures, values, and understanding those and better understanding those to better understand where the constraints are in mindsets, where the the, the what what needs to change in terms of awareness and values in order to uh, optimize, maximize the opportunities for children with uh, disabilities to, to basically have access to good quality learning and, and learning outcomes. So that's two. Um, a third then is just if, uh, the importance also of being comprehensive, both, both in terms of you know, thinking of the, the life's life of the, the child from very early on. Um, so early childhood development, early diagnosis, catching things as early as possible, and then trying to address them as early po as possible through kind of then the, the preschool period and the primary school period and, and beyond. So that's one. Two, also in terms of trying to make sure that we capture both the physical and the mental and psychosocial uh, dimensions of the challenge uh, or of the challenges and so being comprehensive also in in that space when that thinking um, and then third and it's, it relates to the multi-stakeholder process is thinking also in terms of the social systems um, around children so them, them their peers their families their communities their schools um, and, and the other support systems that they would have uh, and bringing those together to support these processes. So super interesting conversation. I can see that there's tremendous appetite among the, the participants for further discussion. So I look forward to the IEI teams 
continuing to engage on this, continuing to bring people together and to advance the learning. Um, thank you everybody very much. Thanks to our translators also for sticking with us. My apologies there for the break in the middle and uh, look forward to continuing to uh, advance the discussions together. Thanks very much. Have a good evening, afternoon, rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.